It will come as no surprise to anyone who has read his astonishing first book, Did You Hear Mommy Died?, which has already become a bestseller, that Guardian columnist Seamus O'Reilly is one of the funniest, most intelligent and most talented people I've ever met. His older brother Dara is one of my lifelong best friends, and I first met Seamus around the time of the events described in the first chapter of the book. Seamus's mother, Sheila, died when he was five years of age, leaving his father, Joe, to, as Seamus puts it, reassemble the universe for him and his ten siblings. The book tells this story, a story of heartbreaking loss, life-affirming love, and seemingly endless and genuinely hilarious litanies of priests, farmers, dogs, idiosyncrasies, and general misadventure. It's also a powerful and poetic meditation on memory. Seamus O'Reilly, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. What a lovely uh, introduction. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. (laughs) So Seamus, your first book, Did You Hear Mommy Died, is already an Irish Times bestseller. But as you revealed to us last week in your Guardian column, your storytelling talents failed you at a key moment when your three-year-old son, Rua, insisted that you make up a story on the spot. Yeah, well, my son is a Philistine. Um, (laughs) I have to get that out straight away. Um, This is not going to reflect well on him, and it's good that it doesn't, because... He's an artless scrub. Um, no, I've uh, b- basically have discovered the, the limits of my uh, my magnetism. Basically, <laughs> uh, I mapped the frontiers of the patience that my son has for my storytelling prize. Uh, he's started asking for us to make stories up off the spot as opposed to doing them in books. And he's very much of the opinion that my wife uh Kira is much much better suited to the task anytime I try and go slightly off the beaten track this is my telling of the tale by the way um (laughs) he no he wants he wants the same thing again he wants the formulaic Hollywood storytelling they give you at the multiplex and all I was trying to do was give him that little taste of cinema verite (laughs) of the old the old bardic traditions of storytelling um but yes so it brought me back to earth uh, after an absolute whirlwind these past two weeks um, in which I've just been astonished at the reaction, really, to be honest, to, to the book. It's been well, incredible. That was, that was my next question. I mean, how do you feel? Obviously, you, you know, you, this is great. What's happening is fantastic. But how are you feeling? How are you processing this reaction that you're getting? It, it's a really good question because to answer it absolutely honestly, which I haven't really <laughs> any time <laughs> asked me, so it isn't exclusive, is I haven't been processing it. I'm completely in shock. Like, mm. um, I mean, I was asked, obviously, my friends are very happy that, that the book is doing so well. Uh, it has, to say the least, exceeded the expectations of, of me and my publishers and stuff. Um, because I am aware of just how hard it is for a book to make an impact. I mean, we've just this year, I've read so many incredible books and friends who've done beautiful, wonderful stuff. And, and sometimes it, it, it reaches an audience and sometimes it doesn't. And there doesn't really seem to be much rhyme or reason as to why that happens. Also, I'm aware that I'm talking about stuff that for some people might be a turnoff. I mean, I think we've seen so many times in all forms of media that you know there's a certain, quite a large percentage of the population, particularly in Southern Ireland and the UK, they don't really want to read about Northern Ireland um, and certainly don't get many opportunities to uh, if they do. Um, and also, you know, it's about grief. It's about loss. I mean, these things are universal, but they're also... They're not necessarily beach read stuff. Uh, at the, if you were to pick up the, you know, the, the title of the book and, and look at the cover, maybe. So I've been delighted that the fact that the book is maybe slightly more accessible than that, that it is filled with very silly gags and that it has, you know, it cuts through and talks about things, hopefully in a way that's not expected, that that's your know, word of mouth really has, has kind of had the biggest impact because as a first time writer, definitely, you know, had a great time doing the column and, and sort of on the social media and stuff, but you know, that doesn't off always off. It doesn't always translate. And I had no expectation that it would, especially as a first time author. So that's been incredible, but the act to see get dozens and dozens and dozens of people sending me the books, you know, at whatever point they're at in it and sending me lovely messages. I mean, I've had probably a dozen or more uh, messages just this week from people who knew mommy like so we're not even talking about people getting in touch and say hey I, I really like the book which is amazing in and of itself it's just so great i'm talking to people who went on school trips with her um a teacher from thornhill where my sisters went 
she he just sent me six pics from this trip 30 years ago six months before she died i'd never seen before um you know that kind of stuff it's too much to process especially yeah, when yeah. you've got so many things going on anyway so hopefully at some point in the next few weeks when things have died down i'll, I'll be able to accept it or, or take it in but for the moment it's just been a white knuckle ride really <laughs> Well, look, I want to get into the, the book in some detail in just a moment. But before I do, I want to put some kind of context to the story and um, your own forays into satire go back quite some distance to uh, early contributions to Pure Dairy. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So Pure Dairy, obviously, most people will know in dairy, uh, was started by Karen Murray. Um, and I came on, I think I, I was really, really enjoying it when it was, it was like a little, when it was early sort of flash pages and people were all talking about so this is pre-facebook pre-youtube pre quite middle early web and i thought so much of it was absolutely priceless i was like 16 or 17 and so i submitted a story and then another story and another story and i think just to shut me up um <laughs> he said okay we'll post that whatever so i did a very early one which was uh phil coulter arrested in town adultery shocker which was about this is the sort of high-minded journalism that, you know, gets you at the top table of the Pulitzer Prize, by the way. But uh, it was, Phil Coulter was arrested because they found uh, a, a sort of a room in his house where he penned all these other love songs to other cities. Uh, like, I hardly approve of Mil Milton Keynes was one of them. Uh, uh, Crystal Whipped was another one. Um, so, like, that kind of stuff. Uh, I always had an ear for very, very silly stuff so although a, a lot of pure dairy did could become slightly more lacerating um rightly and wrongly i think we probably we made some mistakes and you know we were young and stupid and certainly probably didn't really know who was reading or who wasn't but the, it absolutely blew up while i was there not necessarily because i was there but while i was there um it absolutely just blew up and so it was kind of everywhere and uh it was an early it was an early sort of experience of almost what would be like being, you know, like a, a meme or something, you know, where yeah. all of a sudden there was loads of people talking about the thing you did. We remember being sent pictures of like different senior Northern Irish politicians who had like pictures of our articles framed on the wall. Now to Kieran, who was, you know, is a wee bit older, more professional than I was, he was kind of very good at handling all this, but I was 17 and I was just like, oh someone's laughing at my joke this is great so we push it further and further and i think the day after the northern bank robbery we put out an entire issue that was just taking the pace out of that thing mm -hmm. which you know maybe i wouldn't do that <laughs> you know just aim both barrels at a, a prescribed paramilitary organization that absolutely had just robbed a bank in the greatest the biggest heist and British crime history um but you know being young and stupid and some of that stuff I still stand over um <laughs> even if uh, even if maybe a lot of it is slightly dated I and mean, some of it I read back and I don't even remember what it's about because it was so topical as well and I've been, I've been living out of dairy as well for so long I left there when I was 18 so sometimes I'm like I don't even know who that person is that I'm talking about I was, I was very angry about it uh in 2003 but uh, I presume I was in the right I don't know well, I want to deviate slightly from, from writing because one of the aspects of your life that is criminally overlooked but also understand, understandably overshadowed by your literary prowess is your music. Um, you used to make music as Shaco, beautiful IDM electronica. And I suppose I'm, I'm wondering, are you still making music? But also I'd like you to tell us a little bit about you know music in your life, music as a listener, music as a, as a music maker as well. Well, you had a front row seat for an awful lot of my musical escapades. You very... Uh kindly were broadcasting them quite often um to answer your question sadly i'm not making music at the moment uh i kind of got to this point about say about three or four years ago where i was actually making money from journalism like a little bit um as someone who works in media you can probably attest to the fact that it's it's not necessarily the most lucrative thing in the world but it was slowly but surely happening and i was getting other gigs and stuff whereas music never ever had that function mm. uh, obviously doing music for the love of it is is worth doing but also i could probably only support both mentally and financially one uh sort of multimedia pipe team so i will 
I will get back to the old the mm. old console at some point um, because it was something I, I really really love doing and music like you know is still one of the most important things to me I mean there's not very much of it in the book because my real I mean I'm sure you probably had this thing well maybe when I got 11 or 12 or 13 was that kind of that flowering that explosion mm -hmm. and for me um, I mean you mentioned IDM I had a very specific experience where the stuff that was really captivating me was just not stuff that any of my friends were listening to which mm -hmm. on one hand made me feel very cool and special and grown up but the other hand was quite isolating and if you're isolated without a scene maybe uh, and there were pockets of stuff online or whatever that i would kind of like you know communicate with like in regular everyday life everyone else was just going to take that and um east 17 and blur and oasis and you know i could take or leave that stuff but what got my heart racing was afx twin autech or square pusher boards of canada i was a real warp records fanboy and if anyone watching this knows those names they'll know that there's a very dedicated a fervent fan base for that stuff but it wasn't maybe stuff that you'd hear on the high street <laughs> um and so we, we i'd make little cds and like kind of send them to give them to friends and you know through that way we kind of multiplied a bit and it was like bacteria mm -hmm. like slowly but surely they would kind of get either become infected with the contagion for these uh outsider loner musicians who were constantly having photographs of themselves beside pylons you know and <laughs> <laughs> or the opposite would happen and they'd be like what is this why yeah. did you do this why did you give me this have that back mm. uh i mean my dad famously just detested all of my music taste growing up um which is something hey if there's another book I, I might talk about. <laughs> but he i once managed to get around that because I mean, if i was listening to apex twin or plaid or something uh or something slightly more abrasive like autech or like gans graph um my dad would would literally pull the cable from the from the ceiling there as if maybe like there was some sort of effect that would have on the electrics of the house uh even if he wasn't in the room if he, even if he wasn't present it was like if i open a vat of anthrax in the room it was like no even if i'm not in the room it's not safe because it could yeah. be in there later and the vibes would be off and the one time i got away with it was uh one of my favorite albums is drugs by fx twin which is, you know, even I will admit it's a difficult listen in parts, yeah. you know, it's very yeah. angular and abstruse, but there's several tracks on it, which are, you know, some might say unlistenable. I think Charlie Brooker famously said, it's like sticking your head in a CT scanner for an hour, but uh, it's <laughs> some parts of are just, they really just do sound kind of like discordant mm -hmm. machine sounds. Mm -hmm. So my dad came in and was making himself a sandwich or something. And I was listening to this music and I noticed that he wasn't, reacting badly at all i was like this is weird and he said when does this finish and i was like what do you mean and my dad thought the music was so removed from his idea of music that it was one of those cds that he used to have which would test the audio range of speakers by playing random <laughs> high frequency sounds so it was a bit like one of those you know like you you kind of heard like uh that the cost of the cost of during the war their submarines were so old that nato couldn't detect them um it's like Apex Twin had made music that was so far from being music that my dad couldn't even be annoyed by it. <laughs> <laughs> I used to completely, uh, you're moving off music again, but I used to absolutely adore your contributions to Rush Hour Crush, uh, which is a section of the free London newspaper, The Metro. Um, for the benefit of people who have no idea what we're talking about, can you tell us about that? Um, that I used to read them and be crying laughing every time. It was incredible. Well, I uh, landed in London in 2011 uh, after seven years in Dublin uh, for for university, basically, and a little bit of time afterwards partying and, you know, saying why not. Uh, so I ran, landed in London, same story as everyone, not particularly exciting or amazing story, ended up in dead-end jobs. Maybe you might say it was slightly creatively uh, constipated, you know, I didn't have <laughs> the chance to tell everyone all these wonderful thoughts and ideas and just genius that I had. Um, same story as lots of people in their twenties. So I hit upon one possible receptacle for nonsense, which was the Metro, which as you say, is a free paper. It's everywhere in London. I think there's something like 4 million copies in circulation every day. And most are read by multiple people because, you know, it's left on the tube and you pick it mm -hmm. up. And there's a section of it called Russia or crush. Now in other countries, it's called things like misconnection or, uh, you know, kind of shoot your shot or it's 
basic premise in 10 seconds is I saw you on public transport usually. Uh, you looked pretty or handsome. Would you like to go for a coffee sometime? And the descriptions were always incredibly like broad, but sometimes mm -hmm. very specific. So it would be like to the uh, to the hottie in the beige coat on the number 30 last Tuesday morning. Uh, uh, we locked eyes and you were reading a book of Spanish poetry. Do you want to go for a drink sometime? Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, <laughs> if that's 4 million people reading that, and some of these are really weird. Like there was one guy I saw who wrote one. He was like, I, I'd like to apologize to the woman to whom I wrote my number on a, on a five pound note and handed it to her. Uh, I'm sorry that you thought that I was attempting to pay you for sex. Uh, you know, you read something like that. You're like, well, I hope that that's fake. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise that is, they're just too depressing to imagine. So I was like, yeah. well, if that can get in, what can I do? So the first one I tried was, um, I still know it off by heart. Uh, because I'm an egomaniac, <laughs> uh, it was to the to the man who got on a bank dressed like Mr. Chips from Happy Days, or from Happy Days, from Catchphrase. <laughs> Your cheeky smile reminds me of popular sayings. Uh, fancy a drink sometime. And then underneath the signature was girl in bring back hanging t-shirt. <laughs> so I thought that was just, it, it ticked all boxes in terms of being completely <laughs> surreal, utterly nonsensical, and signed by a uh, psychopath <laughs> and it got printed and like as gamblers always tell you you should never win your first bet yeah, because I, I i think i think i got 26 published then in the next two or three years and it got to the point it, it's now got the point where there's there's probably about seven or eight of them which are famous in their own right completely separate from me because obviously i'm signing them with all these stupid names and yeah. i studiously avoided uh you know, ever it being connected to me in the submission process, you know, I'd use a different phone every time, use a different email mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't get wise. But the difference is now that like there's the, every two months, the one about the bearded man who used discarded burger cartons as castanets, that one literally resurfaces and gets a hundred thousand likes for some little meme page every two months. Yeah. Um, there's one called no context Brits which is quite funny. Um, so I, I replied to them several times by saying some context Irishman, that was me. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things. If you put it out there into the ether, you know, as much as the whole central point of them, the thing was, you know, I was kind of making fun of these people for shooting their shot and these lusty howls into the arid void. But then, if I really step back now, five or six years later, it's like, that's, that's what I was doing. I was desperate for people to mm. read stuff I'd done and, mm -hmm. you know, clap and pat me yeah. on the head and tell me how funny I was. Yeah. And by hook or by crook, as stupid and as silly and as, as fun as it was, it did lend itself to other things. It did mean that, you know, people would say, well, if nothing else, he's, he's pretty determined. <laughs> <laughs> um, have, have the Metro ever got in touch? Yeah, several times they did because they would get through. I mean, obviously, I'd have to track all these different emails that I barely used, and sometimes I used friends' emails, and then they'd forward them to me. Once or twice, they would say, <coughs> "Excuse me," they'd say something like, um, "We noticed that you uh, sent out this uh, this letter. Have you ever heard back from anyone?" And like the letter in particular would be something completely insane. So I presume mm -hmm. it's like just a set letter that they sent. Yeah. But then also, I've read then subsequent pieces where it's like we're getting married today and we met on Russia our crush mm -hmm. and you read the story and it's a sweet story but you're just like how on earth did that happen <laughs> so to some to some of them must be real yeah. um but whether they thought they knew that I wasn't on the level or, or not I'm not sure mm -hmm. um I I'd, I'd prefer not to know I think <laughs> I think it would kind of ruin it if I thought they were just in on it but um yeah so yeah ignorance is bliss so on your Twitter page, you are listed as one-time drinks dispenser to Mary Magalise, which is a reference to a tweet of yours that went viral in 2018. And, you know, most people have heard it, have heard this story at this point, but many will have not. And I wonder if you could briefly recap it for us, just to put people in the picture. This is the, the very nutshell version is uh, when I was 18 years old or thereabouts, I was working at a music venue, a very sort of... Uh, upscale music venue in Dublin 
And I thought I had the day off. And so I was relaxing with some friends and was introduced to a certain tranquilizer, uh, shall we say, uh, a cat tranquilizer, sometimes described as a horse tranquilizer, ketamine. Uh, I'd never tried it. I was a very sheltered kid growing up. You know, I was in a big sort of teen, sort of uh, debauched teen. I was really quite green, really, uh, as was the ketamine that was provided in front of me. Uh, I thought, sure, why not? You only live once, but get a phone call. And turns out that I am not off at all. In fact, I am going in for a silver service to basically be the one person in the room while the full sort of chief, 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 top, top boss of the venue is escorting Mary McAleese, the president of Ireland at the time, to show her this season's programmes. So it's kind of like, you know, a, a visit of state that she has to go around and say, oh, wow, that Latvian choir is very nice and oh, fantastic, those African drummers and etc. So I have to stand in the corner with a tray of drinks. So by the time I get to the venue, I'm sweating, as I say, like microwave bread. I'm completely bananas. And I get in there, and I'm like running, but I'm able to play it off and just say, oh, sorry, I ran here. Sorry, I forgot that I was in. So by the time I get in there, I'm no longer just a little bit weird. I'm flamboyantly insane. <laughs> and the thread that you refer to kind of describes my thought process kind of beat by beat. Um, and you know ends in a, in a nice way and hopefully in a way that mary herself didn't feel too aggrieved by i've been told that she has read it um but we've, we've we haven't connected since yeah. uh i published the story we did meet several other times subsequently because that, that was just a venue that she would have been kind of making those kinds of visits to but um yes i hope that it's taken in the spirit it was meant which is one of truth and disclosure um <laughs> So if it has ever caused any undue stress or pain to Mary McAleese or her dependents, then I am truly sorry. <laughs> Let's talk briefly about uh, your Guardian column, which uh, it's, it's three years you're doing that now, isn't it? Three years. I think I just filed my 158th column yesterday. How significant has that been? Has that, has that been the turning point for you? I think it was definitely for UK audience um, because I was in London. I was writing, I had a column for the Irish Times even by the time the, I did the Mary McAleese thing but like again I was still working in a job uh, uh, sort of a, just a day job you know literally putting numbers into spreadsheets kind of job just one of those jobs so um, I had <clears throat> the column and had other bits of writing I was already interviewing you know authors and musicians and sort of stuff that I would have been you know as a kid I would have thought the people that were doing that well probably this is the only thing they did but, but that's clearly not the case i mean if, if it ever was it's certainly not now mm. um but after the mary McAleese story things did kind of pick up in the sense of because so many people so i think something like 80 million people have read that thread now um although trying to work it out from twitter's metrics is kind of hard maybe only five people saw but the numbers <laughs> kind of add up to that so it's just bonkers and it was like yeah. mentioned on like american talk shows and mm. the new york times wrote a whole column about it and I got work for the New York Times off the back of it. I got work for The Observer um, to write a piece about my dad. So they read that story about me getting mashed and meeting the president. It was like, <laughs> Father Day is coming up. Do you want to talk about parenthood? <laughs> um, they read between the lines. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so that was that was a big kind of step up in terms of having a, a weekly audience. It was also a big step up in terms of the proper discipline of, of writing something personal and writing it every week. Um, and the way I write, obviously, is more laced with humour um, and specifically sort of self-deprecation and absurdity and those kinds of things, which is kind of hard to do week by week. I mean, the stuff I've done for the Irish Times has been very cultural criticism based. They've been talking about stuff that was going on online and mm -hmm. weird internet memes and interviewing artists and musicians, <clears throat> novelists, that kind of thing. So here was me talking about myself, which is, as you might have guessed, one of my favourite things to do. <laughs> But it's to, to do it, you know, hmm. to a to a click track every single week. Yeah. Um, it's had an amazing, amazing effect really on my ability to just, you know, find out rhythm and pacing of things, but also just to get stuff done. Um, and in terms of being, you know, a success, like I'm, I'm, I'm continuously surprised how many people read it because, well, as I, I've said many times, like if I if you've got kids, why would you listen to me? Like I don't know anything. <laughs> and if you don't have kids 
why would you read it? <laughs> surely it's boring because it's mostly about, it's ostensibly it's about parenting. It's about my relationship with my son. But um, as anybody who's read it, say two or three weeks in a row, can tell you, it, it very rarely cleaves particularly closely <laughs> to that because he's only three. He doesn't do much that's very interesting. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can only describe my failures and fears so many times. So sometimes we go very off piste and mm -hmm. I discover that I've gone viral because I slagged off the typical Irish holy sacrament that is lasagna with coleslaw. <laughs> uh, or I've started a flame war because I talked about whether you should call your parents daddy and mommy, mom, dad, da, ma. Mm -hmm. Like starting, basically starting a civil war where every parish in Ireland was <laughs> declaring every other one an apostate because they, you know, did you know that in Cork they say mum or say mom and dad? As in the American kind of the yeah, mom. but sort of Cork and Kerry, they do that because it's just close to their, their accent. And I, I'd never heard that before, and I even I felt myself being like, "That's just that's just wrong." <laughs> um, so you can't predict, is what I'm saying. I can't predict <laughs> what uh, reaction you'll get from things. The same as Twitter, it's just a complete. It's kind of a crapshoot, but it's been it's been really nice having a focus and also having you know returning people who kind of get to know your. Your style and get to know the the jokes and occasionally you get people who've just read it for the first time that week and they've taken something very seriously so i did a whole one about my dad doing his genealogy and they i got a, i got a letter from a guy in scotland who was an american of irish descent and he thought it was disgusting how i didn't re respect my irish ancestry and you know i wanted to reply and say but i'm irish I, i'm that's it's not it's not even ancestry like it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's presence tree it's, it's it, like and also it's <laughs> perhaps if you were to do an audit of people who had irish traits i think an ability to really take the pace out of yourself and of your country and of your people it's one of the things i love about ireland and northern yeah. ireland in particular i think is there's not too many sacred cows really once you break down into you know parishes and locales we all are pretty we're pretty open about our failings where does that come from? Where does that come from? Because that is something that's obviously present in your work, but you see it in Derry Girls. I mean, part of the appeal of Derry Girls is that same sense of humour, and it's one that we all recognise. And it's, I mean, you mentioned gallows humour in the book, but where do you think it comes from? Um, I think it's got to be, it's a survival tactic, really. I mean, there's never really been a particularly settled time in Irish history, really. Um, and certainly in Northern Irish history in the last, you know, half century, it's, you know, it's been a lot of horror, an awful lot of very hard to understand things. Um, and grappling with that sort of stuff with, with humor is, you know, it's, it's natural. In fact, I think it's necessary because it unlocks something. And I find that, you know, I occasionally get asked by the Guardian to write opinion pieces about Northern Irish politics, stuff that I'd be kind of angry about or stuff that I'd be at least engaged with. But even then, I can barely, I can rarely manage not to stick in loads of gags. Um, and not just because I don't take it seriously, but because I take it seriously enough to know that that's the best way to get it across. Mm -hmm. Because there's the writing about Northern Ireland, both in the Republic and in the UK, you know, in England and Scotland and Wales, is very, it's either very ill informed and sort of uh, inflammatory or it's incredibly dry. Um, mm. and terrified of offence. So I think you should use your privilege as a Northern Irish person, if possible, to kind of puncture some of that, uh, the sacred cows. And I think, you know, Northern Irish comedy is completely rife for that, even to the point, almost to a point of parody, you know. Um, but it's also just useful because, I mean, I say in the book that probably the only good thing about being Northern Irish is that you're not instinctively scared of other Northern Irish people. And... Uh, <laughs> And I think that's something that I've cleaved to um, and where possible to use that privilege because there's, it's true that an English person or a person from Dublin, you know, if they write some piece about the troubles, you know, you can see knives drawn, ready to catch them out in any little thing. Whereas someone out of the street can literally, you know, make the most lacerating and inappropriate and offensive joke about the troubles and we'll all laugh mm. because we're allowed to. Yeah. So I think we can export that. And I think the book particularly is kind of trying to inviting people to temporarily uh, enjoy the release of laughing at things, which maybe you're told you're not supposed to laugh, whether that be death or it be, you know, 
really crap bombings or the possibility that perhaps sort of arms dumps throughout the countryside are giving cows headaches and heart attack. <laughs> what made you decide to write this book and what made you decide to write this particular book now? Um, I had been talking lots like, throughout my life. I've obviously talked loads about our story. We're a very chatty bunch, as you know firsthand. Um, we are loud and probably kind of crowd each other out for attention because like there's so many of us there's the really desperate little rabid dogs just you know trying to get noticed by by daddy but like by by anyone that will take us um so it's probably natural enough that like the combination of the sort of slightly more outsized uh, aspects of our family history and the fact that we're loud funny slaggy family meant that we would have, you know, refined this story down to, you know, a fine point. You know, we're constantly talking about how weird it was that we had so many people in the family that was not lost on us. How dorky we looked driving around in a minibus that was termed the O'Reilly Mobile by everyone. You know, the fact that <clears throat> your dear friend and my uh, brother, Dara, uh, used to call on us to assemble at primary school by shouting O'Reilly's and we'd all assemble in almost in high order like the like the Brady Bunch you know mortifying stuff and with time obviously what happens is mortifying stuff or hard stuff even tra very very tragic stuff you know tragedy multiplied by time equals comedy kind of thing uh, that's the way that we inter interrogate it we talk about it in terms of how funny things are how embarrassing things are you know even the saddest things just become palatable and you, it's something i've been saying quite a lot in regards to this book but whenever you find those pockets of humor in in death and in sadness it's not an escape from dealing with grief which itself could probably be very useful um it's just another weapon to use or maybe weapons the wrong word but it's another tool to get through it you know it's accelerating the process of getting past things um so the, the book is obviously foreground about my mum's death um and the title is kind of a comment on that it's from a direct quote from me when i was a kid at my mum's wake not really fully understanding the seriousness of the situation <clears throat> arriving somehow unsupervised for five minutes this little ginger three foot tall five-year-old with a big smile on his face at his mother's wake the doorbell's going off the hook and without without warning i fi find myself in front of it and i as the door opens and it's some dejected distraught mourner or some friend of my mom's mother's i stick my hand out and say sort of all happy beaming smile did you hear mommy died um so to me that's hilarious but it's also like incredibly sad um, and I think I wanted that for the title books because I like it as a title and also because it's a story which has followed me my entire life. But that, well, you know, when we're all sitting around the table and we're a few bottles have been knocked down, uh, it's one of those ones that comes up in our most embarrassing moments or whatever. So, but it's also, it symbolizes the, the, the duality of those two things, something that's really sad, but also something that's really funny. And I think that's what the book is like. And I think that's what life is like not to be incredibly trite um but sometimes we read those books that are about you know sad lives and uh you know kind of terrible terrible grief and darkness and you just you read it and you think well was no one there cracking a joke was no one was there nothing there that was slightly strange was there nothing happening out of frame that was inappropriate was there just not a glimmer of light because i've never been to that planet where mm that happens. I mean, I feel the same way sometimes when you watch some real prestige dramas or, uh, you know, an art house film, um, sort of stuff my son would probably hate because of his philistinism. Uh, you watch them and if they're not, it's like they don't allow for the possibility of humor as if it somehow betrays the seriousness of the piece. When I, I don't, I just don't understand that approach because it only well, adds... 
it's 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 almost like music. We were talking about music earlier. It's the major and minor chords. You know, the presence of minor chords is in the context of the presence of major chords, and and that's where the impact comes from. You know, without the major chord, the minor chord doesn't have the same uh, degree of impact, and and that's that's certainly what comes across in, in your uh, rising scale forever. I mean, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Or it's like the and sometimes I feel like some things get a, you know, things get confused. Like the wire, for example, is obviously regarded as one of the greatest TV shows of all time. The Sopranos too. But like they're always talked about in terms of dramatic there, but they're also really funny. And without the, the humor, I, I feel the same way about uh, like loads of things. I mean, I think Angela's Ashes is talked about as the most miserable book ever written. But like you read it and it's really funny. Like mm-hmm. it does have funny. Ulysses as well has got some really, really funny, very playful bits that if it didn't have, it wouldn't be as, as great. It would just be so one note. And my life wasn't one note. My childhood wasn't. And some part part of the impetus behind the book and writing it now was uh, people are often stunned into sort of awkward silence when it's brought up that, you know, I had 10 brothers and sisters and my mom died when I was wee. And then I always have to be on the back foot and say, no, it's, it's all fine, don't worry, it's, you know, because they're sheepish and they're like, Jesus, can I say anything? Um, I'm like, no, you, of course you can, like, it was fine. And, and in lots of ways, we were very lucky mm. because I had a lovely childhood and I spent most of it being as normal and as gregarious and as mortifying as anybody else um but the other side of that coin is if you want to have the slight the lighter the lightness of touch in those passages you have to you have to dig into the deeper stuff as well so probably the hardest part was getting that balance right because i do in the book really i really stare at the cold face a bit in terms of my own grief and trauma because i think the the deal I made with myself was you can put as many stupid jokes in as you want, but you have to earn them with a little bit of soul searching, possibly more soul searching than you're, than you're usually comfortable with. Um, and once I kind of settled on that as a rubric, it was, it was surprisingly easy to spot which jokes needed to stay and which ones didn't mm-hmm. because you're like, that's cheap or that's too much or that's, it's imbalancing something and you just see all of a sudden you'd, you'd see that the, the proper rhythm and flow of it was, you know, really, really helped. How difficult was it to write this book? It was quite difficult because writing a book is an absolute nightmare, um, which I probably didn't realize just how much of a nightmare it was before I started. But in terms of like emotional stuff, yeah, sometimes it was like, you know, I'd have a little weepy Wednesday when I was typing out something. I was like, oh God, I'm so I'm such a beautiful writer and such a loving soul who's just experienced so much. No, but seriously, I would I would occasionally get yeah. quite emotional. Um, but sometimes the hardest thing was just logistics. It was just like, I can't remember very much uh, from this period. And I feel like I'm, this feels thinly sketched. Because like, if you've got a passage which is really detailed about like, I mean, as they say in the book, the first time I tasted a banana sandwich, I can remember. But I don't remember being told that mommy died. Like I obviously was told, but why was that not filmed in my film of vision? Why is there not like more detailed memories of me and my mum? And why do I remember completely random TV shows from mm-hmm. the early nineties instead? You know, it's it's the annoying thing about memory is that you can't really trust it. So. Well, that's actually one of the things I want. That's one of the things I wanted to put to you because one of the aspects of this book that is most impressive is the fact that it's a meditation on memory itself, how we remember, how we assemble memory. And I suppose, I mean, you come from a very large family, and like, you know, shared memory in a family of that of that size must be a contested thing. It must be something that you know. Was there a process of remembering that you had to go through as a family in order to make this book happen? Yeah, well, we did. We set up a little WhatsApp group and you just see, you ask the most mundane thing. I mean, geez, what, four or five weeks ago, um, I was writing a piece about our summer holidays as kids. So I sent someone to there. What do you remember? Or, you know, just a headline. What do you remember about summer holidays? It's like sometimes the take up for these kinds of questions, which I've been given them for three years, four years while we write the book. Uh, sometimes I'll get two or three responses because people are just sick of me mining their brains for the content. But this one just before long, there was like 500 responses, and it was all going in different tangents. And people couldn't remember if someone was in, in uh, Westport, Mayo, or if it was in Mosney, or if it was in Bondoran. Um, all of a sudden, I was hearing stories that I'd never heard in all my life, having just read, written a book about these people. 
they had held all of these amazing stories. Um, the aforementioned Dara and my other older brother Shane, uh, they ended up on a lake, uh, <laughs> jumped on, pushed off, and realized they didn't have any oars in the boat. And they just sat like languidly, just traced futile circles around the lake until they hit a shore, crying, <laughs> alternating between crying and punching each other. Um, finding out that my, my sister Maraids used to get lost so frequently that basically, if they just looked around, like five minutes after we'd entered any zoo, we all have to trap us back to the lost property desk, basically, where eventually they staffed and my dad by name. So like you get all that stuff and you get loads of disagreements, but you also kind of really enrich your own memory. So I started the book with five memories of my mother. And by the end of it, I had ten, uh, eight, mm -hmm. which is pretty miraculous. I mean, if, if nothing else, this book I'm writing it has somehow jarred loose three extra memories, which is pretty amazing <laughs> because, you know, I had those five and I'd kind of written them down in an earlier stage. I thought they were locked in. I thought that was it. That was my lot. So the fact that I got three more was just, just astounding. Mm. Um, so for all, all my childhood, I was kind of resentful of the fact that I had these 10 siblings who were like Soviet informers, like Stasi, always finding me doing something wrong, always dogging me in, mm. always ready to catch you out or to make fun of you for doing something stupid. And then it turns out that they're invaluable, really, when you're writing a book about your life, because I didn't remember saying did you hear mommy died? I mean, luckily I've heard that story for years and years, but there's loads of other examples of people saying, oh, you had brand new cords for the wake and oh, actually you would have been sitting here and that person was there and actually um, Deva, she cried so much, she had to be taken out of the funeral and all this. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, all those little details, they add to the layers and they, they make the thing a bit more rich and a bit more lived in. And mm -hmm. to some extent that would have been completely impossible without their cooperation and subsequently their enthusiastic uh, reaction to the book which has been mm. a real bonus your father joe comes out of the book quite accurately as a towering stoical hero how has he reacted to it uh he loves it um i think he loves the reaction at least mm -hmm. he did really like the book so i read it to him and he was very pleased with it although it was a bit awkward mm -hmm. i mean well because i'm reading it to him i mean i've said this before but it's it is a bit like that thing where you sit down at a party and the guy beside you gets out the guitar and he says, oh, this is one of my own songs. And like, it could be the best song in the world, but like your heart sinks. Doesn't it? <laughs> so you know, it's, it's just demanding too much of your attention and like desperate not to offend the person. You know, it's horrible. It's a terrible dynamic. <clears throat> but because my my dad can't read text anymore because of the because uh, of his diabetes. So I had to read it to him um at some point or he'd have to wait for the audiobook but i wanted him to hear it before it was published so i finally managed to get back to Derry for the first time all year due to everything that's been going on obviously and he's double vaxxed and it's all good and i said yeah okay two or three nights in a row i'm going to read you some bits in the book i think i got about half of it read to him maybe just a bit more than that and it was really awkward at the start because i was awkward because he was mm -hmm. nervous mm -hmm. and but it was it was amazing. It was amazing because he he just he relaxed into it. Like he had um, he had some really funny observations about things. I mean, some mm. that were completely uh, bewildering to me. Uh, you know, places and dates of things which I, you know were not really necessarily an important part of the story I was telling. So I'm in the middle of doing something very moving and beautifully written about uh, you know love and death and loss and all that stuff. And he'll interject and say, no, no, we got that caravan in 1990. Um, well, the, the one you're thinking of was, was, was way later than that. Uh, I was like, okay, all right. So do you want, sorry, are you going to give me the license plate as well? Just <laughs> make sure that you're interrupting the flow of this pure poet. Um, and like he, he'd pop in and say other things like, I, at one point I'd say, I think fairly accurately that he knew every single priest in Ireland, you know? I said, I, I don't, I've always felt like my father knew every priest in Ireland. This is because he did know every single priest in Ireland. And he said, there should be a disclaimer on every page. This is just complete exaggeration. And after like two or three minutes of conversation, to that 70 to 80% would be more accurate. <laughs> so, you know, I couldn't have asked for anything better because if he just sat there still with me, <coughs> fawning over me as a genius, I, I would have been freaked out. It wouldn't yeah. have. 
I wouldn't have enjoyed that at all. I don't think, I think that would be, it would be weird. I needed the corrections. I needed the, I needed the points where he didn't get the jokes or he didn't care for the jokes. Mm. You know, I'm aware that my dad who's in his mid seventies is not going to have the same sense of humor as me, you know, uh, pick two random people on the street the same age and they're not going to have the same sense of humor. So I was prepared for that to happen, but I was astonished how much he did laugh and how much he, how much he appreciated that the balance between the sad stuff from the happy stuff didn't demean either half. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was really the most important thing for me was that I didn't make a show of him and a show of myself with a book that was insincere or got, uh, got that stuff wrong, got the tone wrong, got the, the treatment of the subject matter, because you can write a funny book about sad stuff that isn't making fun of it and that isn't belittling it. And you can push that line very, very far. Um, but once you break it, that's, yeah, that's that's the thing you have to avoid where it's just like, you're going for an easy gag there. Yeah. There's probably loads of easy gags and your mileage may vary. I'm sure there's there's sacred cows that have mm. kind of gone a bit too close towards killing uh for some people and that's absolutely fine and you know all opinions are valid but um for my dad alone that audience of one that i was thinking of probably in the back of my head uh as i was writing the book that he enjoyed it was was amazing and everything else after that has been just gravy you mentioned the uh the priests there a moment ago and you know there's a revolving door of colorful characters in, in this book including several very colorful priests one of whom broke into your house while you were all out for the day and helped himself to beer and biscuits while watching Match of the Day. Did that actually happen? Tell me that actually happened. Not only that, but Steve, I can give you an exclusive. Go for it. I'd remembered and in fact wrote in the book that he'd gone in through a window. My dad, when I read him that bit, he confirmed that actually said priest, who I refer to as Father Finbar Staples, because I gave all the priests really stupid names. Because I was going to say that, Huck Balance. You know, I was in Derry at that time. There was nobody called Hustings Lafarge. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, by the way, a sidebar off the, this sidebar, but uh, Huck Balance obviously is his name for a, a priest I'm sure a lot of people will recognize very easily, yeah. um, but we'll keep his name out of it for now. But yeah. uh, my publisher said, oh, you should change the name. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I would probably says, yeah. Particularly uh, that guy says, oh, yeah, okay. Um, he was a priest that ran a cinema in Derry, so I'm pretty sure you know no one will guess who I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, but yes, so my dad. Anyway, I told him the story about Father Finbar Staples breaking into the house, which my dad doesn't think is a funny story. By the way, he doesn't understand. <laughs> he thinks oh, we were very close friends, and he knew about. But I wouldn't mind. So like, yeah, okay. I know you, you wouldn't have been angry, but like, is it at least a noteworthy thing? Because he doesn't even think when we talk about it all the time, he doesn't think. That it's even a memorable occasion that he came yeah. home after three hours and our house had just been used like a clerical bird feeder <laughs> by this priest. Anyway, I get to the end of it. He is laughing at it. I'm, I'm able to show him the light of, of the comedy of the moment. I, he, he says, look, you know, he wasn't on his own, you know. He was there. He had his nephew with him. And it was his nephew who was 10 years old who Jimmy opened the window and was sent up like a, like a Dickensian street urchin up the chimney, yeah. Up, up the chimney. Basically went on through the, the, the utility room window that was slightly on the latch just to let the pipe out for the, the vent dryer. And uh, I was like, well, that's even better. I'm so annoyed that it didn't happen. Well, you should have asked me. So, Danny, I've asked you probably a hundred <laughs> times. So memory is changeable even to the point where my dad can read the book and listen to the book and still come away with uh, a fifth or sixth or seventh version of the same story that he's told me so many times before. So maybe it's not all my fault. It's a predictable and obvious question to ask, but important nonetheless. Um, has writing this book been significant for you in processing your own bereavement? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, probably more so than I thought in terms of uh, putting together things which I maybe didn't think were connected. So definitely my kind of performative bookishness as a kid um, and, you know, going around spraying people with facts which I still do to some extent I mean I don't get out as much so I don't get the chance and as already stated the person I have most contact with is my three-year-old son who you know is a witless dullard so if um, I 
so but like even like definitely in my student days and like in my 20s i was that guy who was like oh actually have you ever heard this or you read that book or do this you know kind of always on really um and i think some part of that was about the fact that i felt guilty for from forgetting my mom uh, or like all those memories that i'd forgotten i mean um and also that sort of the thing i mentioned about clamoring for attention in the family um that's kind of partly about big family dynamics that i think are true of people who haven't suffered bereavement but are probably slightly more pronounced when you've got one head of the family who's so spectacularly overtaxed in terms of his bandwidth of attention he's working a 40-hour work week he is driving all over the place taking us everywhere and then you know at the end of the night we all want to be the sole protagonist of reality and Mm -hmm. you can't be you know it's just that's you know into into so many parts you know that that calculus doesn't go so you kind of have to go back and pick things apart and realize well maybe that's why i was so desperate for attention and maybe that's why i was drawn to things like 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 pure dairy for example or like twitter eventually which is kind of the same thing um and then also just very specifically kind of about my mum and how i would have been you know so affected by it but in waves like i described in the book a sort of a it was an appendicitis that i had but which untangling a lot of the sort of things that happened before and after it it became clear that it was probably something like a breakdown and um, mm-hmm. completely subconscious completely stress related but like i couldn't put a finger on the stress i just stopped sleeping and then from that obviously I just my health deteriorated and from that i think the appendicitis come i don't mm-hmm. think i don't think grief can give you an appendicitis directly but there's just mm-hmm. loads of indirect mm-hmm. steps um and also the fact that i probably at all of these points where i have this little breakdown or breakthrough or whatever i probably thought ah oh, that's good grief finished tick and then that's not what happens because mm-hmm. four or five years later you some other milestone or some other thing and mm-hmm. you know when i had my 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 own son you know that opened up loads of stuff it was like i see my mother-in-law uh marion who i adore who's so wonderful with my son and you know that makes sense oh that'd be nice um which is not something i had for example at like my confirmation day or like my graduation or anything like mm-hmm. I, I just it wasn't part of my brain to think oh i wish mammy was here because she ju- it just hadn't been established as a tradition in my life that she would be at these things uh and also the fact that's connected to that which is i had a different grief from all of my siblings and we all had different grief from each other and mm-hmm. to some extent a 10 year old will have a galaxy's difference of of, of bereavement than a five-year-old than a 15 year old than a 20 year old i mean sometimes you know in my, in my adult life i've obviously you know we've all had friends who've suffered that at 25 or 30 and sometimes i think insofar as you can do these silly judgments but i think maybe that would have been worse for me maybe that would have hit me harder i mean i certainly think it would have hit me harder in some ways you know but then you'd also would have had a whole life's worth of memories um and what's you know grief kind of draws you to making those horrible little algebraic conundrums and saying what would it be better if i was older and i had more memories or is it better to be deprived of those but also to just maybe it's easier to get over the person or to kind of like have a child's sheer resilience you know that smooth plastic brain that a child has whereas if it happened when you're a teenage hormones would that be worse again and you know you kind of start thinking about that stuff and writing a book length meditation on those things kind of shook a lot of stuff out that I didn't expect. I kind of thought that I was, I mean, again, I thought I was done. I was like, I want to write a book about how I feel. And then it was like, oh no, I feel this way. I didn't realize, <laughs> um, which is good. Obviously it keeps keeps the text alive because there were loads of stuff I had to delete because I went back and I said, that's, that's insincere. That's not actually true. I let myself off the hook. I let the reader off the hook. Um, I was sad in that. And I was angrier than that. I was, you know, X, Y, or Z little snippet. I'd be like, nah, that's, that's glib. Um, as much as there's loads of glibness in the book for comic effect, I was like, I started to see the bits that weren't, mm-hmm. um, that weren't, that weren't achieving the effect. They were kind of working against it. It was just being sort of, it's too easy. Mm. Um, so 
that kind of was the big the big difference was as I started re re-editing and editing and editing I was like shit this has actually affected me way more and in way more ways than I thought so for that I have my publisher to thank it's like some free some free counseling or a psychiatric evaluation I just had to do it myself for my laptop for three years sort of never really sure if I was ever going to get it finished Seamus it's an absolutely astonishing book um it, it's out now on fleet uh it's an absolutely magnificent piece of work congratulations um it is genuine it's, it has the most amazing effect because you're reading the book at times and you feel yourself welling up you're about to burst out crying you read the next line and you burst out laughing instead it's just it is just an absolutely unbelievable piece of work and I, sincerely i just want to congratulate you on it. it it is incredible stuff i was speaking to your brother this morning i was well we were messaging each other and he drew my attention to the fact that um the author matt haig uh gets uh, some of his fans get lines from his book tattooed on their arms and he suggested that i ask you what line from your book would make a good tattoo <laughs> well um this was mentioned the other day and someone managed to tease my dad into getting a post-it note with a certain line uh on the on the thing which was slagging him off on on his arm um i did think about it i mean i really do like that line about the only good thing about being northern irish is that you're not scared of other northern irish people i was very proud of that there's a line that i really like which is describing my granny um uh from pictures because she died when i was two so i didn't really know her, but like in pictures she's so stern i described her as she looked like someone who would keep her arms folded on a trampoline um and i think I'm always reaching for that kind of line yeah. that has an economy to it and is just, just short of being too much, hopefully. Um, so it'll probably be something like that. I mean, I'm sure Matt Haig's fans have got much more beautiful and meaningful sort of statements. Um, for me, it would probably be a really silly gag uh, like that. Seamus, it has been a joy talking to you, as it always is, and hopefully I'll get to chat to you in real life pretty soon. But congratulations once again on the book, and thank you very much indeed for being part of this today. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, and there are signed copies in Little Acorns, so go there. And uh, dear Steve, so much. This has been really great.